All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome in to Tuesday Night Bible Studies. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're start, starting a few minutes later than usual. Um, we are going to be picking up in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, and my hope is we'll get through chapters 23 and 24 tonight. Uh, where we left off, St. Paul arrived in Jerusalem, uh, as was his plan. Uh, to be there for the Feast of Pentecost, and now he's he was in Jerusalem, and as he was after visiting, of course, St. James and the elders of the church, he was in the temple uh, being purified with several men who had taken a Nazarite vow. Uh, St. James had, if you remember, St. James had advised him to go through that process to show that he was indeed adhering to the law, you know, that he was indeed a an abiding you know, a law abiding Jew. And so he was going through this process and the uh, Jewish authorities from Asia that had been giving him so much trouble through his missionary journeys were there for the feast and they spot St. Paul and they start this mob essentially. And they begin to, they, first of all, they grab him, they throw him out of the temple and they begin to beat him up. He was, re he was rescued essentially by the Roman commander uh, Lysias and his troops and was being taken to the Roman uh, garrison there, the barracks uh, for protection and to be in interrogated. And St. Paul was, he gives an address. He addresses his Jewish brothers, tries to make a defense for himself. But as soon as he mentions his missionary to the Gentiles, his mission to the Gentiles, they want nothing to do with him anymore. And they, the Romans kind of whisk him away. Um, they are intend on interrogating him by scourging. If you remember, that's where, that's where we left off. And St. Paul informs them kind of coyly that he, uh, he is a Roman citizen. And so he obviously has more, you know, has rights essentially because he's a Roman citizen. And so they don't, uh, they don't end up scourging him. Uh, they release him from his bonds and he's being held. Um, he's being held there by the Roman, um, commander. For protection beginning in chapter 23 we'll see that because and at the end of chapter 22 they decide to have another gathering with the jewish high court the sanhedrin so this is where we're going to pick up directly in chapter 20, 23 23 is a continuation from 22 there's really no break and saint paul now is about to address the high priests and the, the high court and uh, give his basically his account for why he's not guilty of any crimes, whether that be under Roman law or, or Jewish law. So without further ado, if there are no other questions, any, any questions so far? No. Okay. Uh, we will jump right into the text of chapter 23 of the Acts of the Apostles. So we're in chapter 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So... St. Paul, you can tell right off the bat that St. Paul is not intimidated standing in front of the Sanhedrin. You know, he's not, you know, he's not looking at the ground. He's not shuffling his feet. He's look, he looks right at them, right? He's, he, he's staring them in the eyes. And um, because of his clear conscience, he knows he hasn't done anything wrong. He knows that everything he's done has been by the will of God. So he, he, he stares at them earnestly. He's looking at them, you know, eye, face to face, eye to eye. Even though he begins his defense very politely, addressing the court as men and brethren, uh, and really it doesn't really say anything. You know, he just says that I haven't done anything wrong. So essentially all he says. Uh, the high priest has, you know, one of his cronies uh, strike St. Paul in the face, on the mouth, it says here. Uh, this high priest uh, will, as he's named in verse two, is Ananias. Ananias was the high priest from 47 to 59 AD, thereabouts. Uh, and he was not, he was known for being a ruthless leader of the people, and uh, he was not above violence, as we see here, immediately resorting 
to violence in this case to try to shut St. Paul up. And maybe it's that he saw St. Paul wasn't intimidated by them and he tries to kind of strike some fear in him. Or maybe he just out of his anger, you know, at what St. Paul has, has been doing and saying, he has him, has him struck, but he's not above violence. Um, St. Paul responds basically by accusing the high priest and the court of hypocrisy, you know, becoming now to judge him and condemn him according to the law of Moses, while they themselves are not following the law of Moses themselves, because it was, it was against the law to strike somebody or punish somebody before being found guilty. So St. Paul is saying, you come here to judge me according to the law, you're not even following the law, you know. Um, in other words, you, re you really don't care about the law at all. That's what he's telling them. You, you're a, you hypocrites, right? You, you, you don't care about the law at all. You're just using it as a pretense to have me killed because you don't like that I'm, you know, preaching and bringing people to Christ. St. Paul actually shows that he's the one that knows and cares about the law because he quotes, he quotes the Mosaic, he quotes the Torah here when he says, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. He's quoting verbatim the Torah. So St. Paul's showing that like, oh, look, you guys are not following the law. But I know the law, you know, and I and I live that law as a Jew, you know, I, I live it and I follow it. Very similarly, right, it's very similar to the things that Jesus, you know, taught and said to the to the Pharisees, you know, in his life. You remember, you know, and in, in, uh, we, we always hear it in Holy Week uh, on Holy Monday night, the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 23, where the Christ Again and again, it says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, right? They're hypocrites. Again and again, Jesus' Jesus's charge against them is, is hypocrisy, right? You, you know, you travel, uh, you know, you travel a thousand miles to make one proselyte, and then you make them a greater son of Gehenna than yourselves, right? You, you, uh, you whitewash tombs, you know, you, you clean the outside of the cup, and you leave the inside full of, you know, extortion and rapacity. So he, Christ himself in the Gospels, he, he, that was his charge against them all the time, was their hypocrisy. And so now St. Paul basically is showing that nothing really has changed, that he, you know, is the, that they're still practicing that hypocrisy, um, and says that just, just as you have struck me, God will strike you too. Again, which, in, which mirrors the, the mosaic law because in the mosaic law we have god says you know basically eye for an eye tooth for a tooth so saint paul says you struck me you're going to be struck as well and um saint paul's prediction eventually comes true so in 70 a.d uh war is breaking out with rome in judea the judea there's a rebellion a revolution and ananias is, is killed by uh zealot assassins he's assassinated so St. Paul, St. Paul's prediction here um, eventually does come true in 70 AD for Ananias. All right, verse six. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So uh, St. Paul proclaims here, the core teaching of the Christian faith, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also the anticipated resurrection of all people at the end times, right? So St. Paul says, this is what I'm being judged for, that I proclaim the resurrection. And he claims to, you know, that he's a Pharisee and that he's a, a son of Pharisees. And so he, seeing that there's kind of these two camps represented in the, in the courtroom there, he uses this core teaching of the church to basically divide the room against himself right he takes he takes their accusations and he makes them instead of being about him and his person making it about a, a a hot button topic that the two groups don't agree on right and instead of being so instead of being essentially about saint paul saint paul makes it about the resurrection of the dead which the sadducees refuted and which the pharisees defended and and preached and so this big quarrel breaks out essentially in the courtroom they begin fighting with one another and 
the Pharisees eventually are actually supporting St. Paul saying he's innocent, you know, he's innocent. And if someone has, you know, if an angel or a spirit has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So um, uh, St. Paul shows a lot of um, tactical awareness. I don't know if that's the right word here, but he, he definitely knows how to read the room and he knows how to, you know, use his words here in order to get himself out of a pickle because he understands right away, right? When he's, all he says is, I have a clear conscience and he gets whacked in the face, right? He understands that they're not interested in hearing what he has to say, okay? So he's trying to basically live to fight another day. And so he divides the room against itself. I was reminded today reading this passage that in Matthew, the words of Christ in Matthew 20, 12, uh, excuse me, Matthew 12, verse 25, where he, Christ says, um, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And that's what we see here in the Sanhedrin. St. Paul divides them, you know, by proclaiming the resurrection and their claims against him begin to crumble. Um, and so he's, uh, we'll see that he, he uses that as a, an opportunity to kind of get out of the courtroom. When, they, when the Pharisees say, well, if an angel or a spirit has spoken to him, this is referring to St. Paul's account of his vision of Christ on the road to Damascus. So they're saying, well, if, if an angel has spoken to him, you know, let us not fight against God. They're not embracing what he's preaching, right? That the voice was Jesus's and that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're using it as more ammunition to oppose the Sadducees. Because at this point, that's what they're more worried about. They're more worried about... Um, upholding their own stances against the the Sadducees because they didn't like each other they were opposed to each other and there was always tension um, between them not only because of the different things that they taught but because there was a power struggle over the temple so so now there's this big chaotic scene in the courtroom now when there arose a great dissension the commander fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So St. Paul's, St. Paul's ploy works, right? The, the Roman commander comes, sends his soldiers and gets St. Paul out of there. And he, uh, he, so he survives their murderous intentions one more time. Um, so as the two groups are going at each other, the, the Roman soldiers come and take him away. That night, as he's, in, as he's again imprisoned, uh, the Lord appears to him again, right? He gets, an, he gets a, another visit from Christ, which, you know, is interesting, right? And just, we just heard, right, if, if, an, if an angel or a spirit has spoken to him, you know, let us not stand against him and fight against God. Well, here, we see, St. Luke affirms to us again, right, that it was no angel and no spirit. It was the Lord himself coming and speaking to him. Um, and here in, in this instance, he offers St. Paul words of comfort and words of peace, right? He just, he was just pulled out by the Roman army out of this chaotic, murderous courtroom. He's going to find out in, in just the next verses, right? He's going to find out that there's going to be a big plot by these assassins, basically this mob, assassin mob to kill him. So there's all this uncertainty all this danger around him and so the lord comes and says be of good cheer right be be cheerful you know don't don't be sad because just like you've testified here you're also going to go to rome so this gives saint paul the knowledge right the faith that he's going to he's going to make it to rome right they're not their plots against him are not going to succeed that uh, he's going to he's going to be able to move on from this from jerusalem and eventually will make his way to Rome. The, the Lord refocuses St. Paul on the work that's coming, right? He's basically saying, don't worry about the things that have happened, you know, and are happening, because you have to think about the things that are coming up, you know, the, what, the things that you have to do, you still have to do, you still have work to do, St. Paul, so that's what he's telling him. So he's encouraging him for that work that's ahead, and uh, getting him ready for the next stage of his, of his journey. Um, remember, several several meetings ago we talked about how saint paul's mission you know one of the things saint paul wants to do is he wants to make it to rome not only to preach and, and establish a church there but he wants to he wants to he wants to meet caesar you know he wants to meet the caesar 
and preach to Caesar and convert Caesar. And so, you know, Jesus is saying, this is where you're going to go. You're going to, you're going to get there. Um, and then he tells St. Paul that when he gets to Rome, you will bear witness to me in Rome. There's kind of a dual meaning for bearing witness. First of all, obviously through his words, through his teachings, uh, through the preaching of the gospel, but also through his martyrdom, right? St. Paul will eventually be martyred in Rome, he will shed his blood there for Christ, and he will bear testimony or bear witness in that way as well. And really the Greek word martyras, which is where martyr comes from, means witness. You know, uh, somebody who dies for Christ bears witness to Christ through their death. So St. Paul will bear, bear, will bear witness uh, to Christ and Rome in, with, in more ways than one. All right, we're in uh, verse 12 now. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest that the commander he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So this group of 40 men, they decide that they're going to take matters into their own hands. They are tired of waiting for courts to make decisions. They are tired of watching St. Paul get, you know, rescued by the Roman army. And so they are uh, going to take matters into their own hands. They have this plot you know, ask for St. Paul to come, you know, be brought to the court again. And as he's being transported, then we'll be there ready, ready to kill him because they don't have the manpower to go and storm the Roman garrison, right? And, and kill St. Paul. But if a few guards are transporting him to the court, right, they may, they may be able to overpower them and, and kill St. Paul as they're, as they're hoping for. They show that they're willing to die for this cause, right? They feel very strongly, very passionately about this very zealous about this because, you know, to attack Roman guards and a Roman citizen would have meant certainly that some of them would have been killed, right? And that the Roman army would have responded and brought with force, you know, would have, would have come down on them um, to deal with, to deal with that and that threat. So they're willing to die for it. They've taken this oath that they're not going to eat anything or drink anything, which means that they intend on doing this immediately, right? You don't take an oath that you're not going to eat and, uh, and, plan the attack three weeks later, right? They're, they're ready to carry this out as soon as possible. Um, so this is the plot now against, uh, against St. Paul. And these, and these men see themselves as, you know, as martyrs for the cause, cause as well. Uh, if you remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, he says, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. So remember, St. Paul's crime here that they're charging him with is that he defiled the temple, right? Which is a uh, punishable by death. And so they're, they're willing now to, they think that they're doing something for God, that they're going to take this, you know, treacherous traitor and they're going to, they're going to kill him. So they think they're doing something good. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring you this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So we see uh, here God's providence, right? Uh, that this, these 40 assassins have made a plot to kill St. Paul. And it starts to leak out, you know, as, as, is, the, as is the tendency when you have such a large group of people. The word starts to leak out, right? That this is the plan. This is what's going to happen. And who overhears it? Who finds out about it? St. Paul's nephew finds out about it, right? Like the, you see God's providence there, right? Like of all the, you know, of all the people, you know, to hear about this plan, one of St. Paul's own relatives. St. Paul's not even from Jerusalem, you know? 
um, even though he's told us he was raised in Jerusalem, he's from Tarsus. Um, so it's possible that, you know, St. Paul's, you know, nephew is in town for the feast of Pentecost like he was, you know, he's not, he doesn't even live there. And yet he's the one that hears about this and he wisely comes to seek out St. Paul and um, tells, tells him basically about the plan. And St. Paul works him up the chain of command, uh, you know, to keep passing the information along to keep St. Paul safe. Um, we also, I mean, really, it's, it's interesting that this is the first time we've really heard anything about St. Paul's family, right? We didn't know, this is the first time we found out he has a sister, right? He has a nephew. And we don't really know him much more beyond that. Um, now, uh, an important, one important thing for us as we read the scriptures is, you know, we, we, that the scriptures are not like exhaustive biographies of all these people, right? Like we don't, uh, the truth is that we don't know a lot about the, you know, the, the private lives of these apostles and what their families were comprised of. Were they married? Were they not married? Did they have children, uh, you know, siblings? We don't, we don't have that information. So we do get it in little snippets like this, right? Like, oh, and, and St. Luke doesn't make a big point of it. He just says, oh, St. Paul's daughter, uh, sister's son was there and heard about it and went and told St. Paul. Um, it's very likely, too, that this is a young, it's a young boy, like a, like a child. Uh, I think the key detail here is like when he goes to the commander, he takes him by the hand, right? He kind of like pulls him aside by the hand and they talk privately. It gives us an inclination that he's probably not like 20 years old. He's probably more like 10 years old. And he comes in, um, you know, he really saves St. Paul's skin here by, by, you know, conveying this information to the Roman uh, commander. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him. Tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. So, uh, you know, he tells the young boy, Don't tell anybody you told me this, because of what's going to happen, of course, is they're going to change their plans. They'll probably come after the boy, too, for for ratting them out. Um, and then he, um, he's, he decides that he's going to send St. Paul on to Caesarea um, with a great army of, of escorting him there, right? Basically saying, okay, you thought that you were going to get him with 40, 40 guys. Okay. Bring them, you know, bring them out, you know, let's, you know, come, come and do your worst. Right. He, but he has 470 Roman soldiers escorting St. Paul out of Jerusalem. So, Basically, he's untouchable at that point. You know, there's nothing they can do. Um, and as a Roman citizen, uh, St. Paul's case would have had to go to Caesarea anyway. So this gives this gives the, the commander in Jerusalem a great excuse to get rid of St. Paul, because obviously he's causing a lot of headaches for him um, to send him now to Caesarea and let him be let him be that governor's problem. Um, so he decides that the time is now. This is happening now. We're, amass your troops and let's get him to Caesarea. Again, we see here once again in the scriptures, right? God using a non-believer, right, to advance his to advance his plan. So God here in this case uses this pagan Roman commander to protect Saint Paul and to further his mission to Rome. So, for the message there for us is right that a lot of times we think we're unworthy of you know being of service to the church or of service to God. God can use all of us, right? If we allow Him to. If we offer ourselves in service to God, he will, he will use us for his purposes, um, to spread the gospel, to bring peace and joy in the world, um, to bring comfort to those who are, you know, in pain, whatever it may be, you know, all of us have something to offer. So all of us have gifts that we can bring to the table. Uh, so the, the commander sends them out at night. The third hour of the night would be three hours after sunset. So imagine nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, making it also more difficult for these assassins to attack them because they're not trained. So to go out at night and attack a Roman force would have been even more difficult than doing it during the day. So really, they've made it impossible now for the for this for this plan to go through. So we're in verse 25. He wrote a letter in the following manner. This is the Roman commander. Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. 
This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with troops, I rescued him, having learned he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of, deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So Lysias sends this letter along with St. Paul to explain the situation uh, as he's going now to be sent to the governor, Felix. Uh, Felix was governor in Caesarea from 52 to 59 AD. So it gives us again the time frame, right? We're, we're in the, we're in probably the early to mid, you know, 50s AD. So Lysias, uh, he, he kind of twists the truth a little bit here, right? He says, oh, I saw them, I saw them beating this man and I, I found out he was a Roman citizen and I came and rescued him, right? Uh, that's not exactly how it played out. If you remember, he found out actually much later that St. Paul was, that St. Paul was a Roman. He was about to scourge him. He had him tied up and was ready to scourge him. And then St. Paul said, oh, is this, is this how you treat Roman citizens now? So he found out later. Of course, Lysias is not going to tell Felix that because he would have him in trouble himself. So he, uh, he definitely polishes the story up a little bit for his own you know, needs um, to keep himself uh, safe and in good graces with the, uh, the higher ups in the Roman uh, hierarchy there. Um, he also notes, though, to Felix, right, that in his judgment, in his estimation, St. Paul was not deserving of death or imprisonment, right? He says, you know, I found out what the accusations were, but nothing, none of their charges really did show that he's deserving of death or, or chains. So that's important, you know, for us as, as, this, as these trials continue to show that, you know, there's basically for anyone outside of the Sanhedrin, they all see St. Paul as innocent. So... All right, verse uh, 31. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day they left the, ho they left the horsemen to go on with him and returned to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. So once the company reaches this military outpost of Antipatris, the assassins in Jerusalem are no longer, they're no longer like a threat. You know, the, 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 there's a military outpost there. There's plenty of Roman soldiers there to protect St. Paul. So the majority of the groups sent out from Jerusalem now return to Jerusalem. Um, and St. Paul continues with the 70 horsemen on his way now to Caesarea. And he finally gets to Caesarea. And uh, Felix reads the letter and says, okay, when your accusers come, then I will hear what you guys have to say. He's kept in a place called Herod's Praetorium. This was a palace built by Herod the Great, which at this time was basically the residence for the Roman governors. So this is where Felix would have been living. And uh, St. Paul is going to be staying there under guard. And this is a place where he can be safe, you know, until the time of his trial. So we'll jump right in now to chapter 24. After Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. So it shows, first of all, that they mean business. First of all, that the high priest comes to Caesarea. Second of all, that they bring with them uh, Tertullus, an orator, somebody who was skilled in speech to make the case against St. Paul. It's like the equivalent of like hiring like a very high profile attorney to, to, to do your case, you know. So they, they have brought along, you know, this other uh, orator who is going to be representing them. And, and Tertullus is a Roman name. So it's, it's even possible that Tertullus was not Jewish at all, but that he was hired on by the Sanhedrin, you know, to, to come and, and make their case for them. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, 
a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple and, was, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So Tertullus makes his you know, opening remar remarks and basically makes the claims against St. Paul. And the rest of the council, you know, is nodding their heads in agreement. So uh, he starts out basically with flattery, you know, he's, you know, trying to butter up Felix here. But, uh, you know, the ancient uh, historian Tacitus, he paints a very different picture of Felix than this one that Tertullus is, you know, portraying here. One who he was a governor who basically was very violent. He had a reign of terror and uh, basically made a life miserable for the Jews <laughs> under his under his jurisdiction. So the fact that Tertullus begins, you know, his accusations against St. Paul, which with, you know, this praise and flattery that was very blatantly false, would have shown St. Luke's audience, right, the ancient readers of St. Luke's text here, you know, what a farce this was, right, that the, the claims against, like, if this is how he's going to start his, you know, his words, then you know basically everything that comes after it is garbage too, because this is just you know it's just a bunch of garbage. Um, so that's that's how he's that's how he starts out. Um, notice too that there's not even really an accusation, right? That he did this, you know, he started a riot at this time, and he he amassed this army, or or you know he went into the temple with foreigners, right? It, there, there's no real accusation, right? Just that all oh, he goes throughout the Jewish world and he's a ringleader of the Nazarenes, which means the Christians, you know, he's he's creating dissension among the Jews. He wanted to profane the temple. Right. He tried to profane the temple. It doesn't say that he profaned the temple. Right. It says he tried to profane the temple. There's no accusation of anything that he actually did. So um, and while it's true that trouble followed St. Paul everywhere that he went, as we know, having read this text. It's not St. Paul that's causing the trouble. It's, you know, the Jewish leadership everywhere that he went, basically trying to go after him and get rid of him. So Tertullus leaves out that important detail that all this drama everywhere that St. Paul goes is not his, it's not of his own making. It's of the making of the Jewish authorities. Of course, they're trying to play up, as we've talked about many times throughout reading this book, they're trying to play up on the Roman sensibilities of maintaining peace and squashing any kind of unrest they're basically saying this guy's a, this guy just creates unrest he creates dissension you know he calls he starts arguments he's always arguing with us he stirs up the people and this would have been things that the romans would not have been favorable towards right well we don't want people stirring up any anybody right we want peace we want to uh, to keep the peace throughout the empire then paul after the governor had nodded to him to speak answered and as much as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. So St. Paul, although he speaks very beautifully here, he does not start out with the same flattery. As Tertullus, but he appeals to Felix as an experienced judge. He doesn't say, oh, you've been such a great leader and things have been so great under your care and thank you for everything that you do. He says, I know that you've been a judge for a long time, so I'll answer you myself so that you can see the evidence basically against me and you can just, you know, you can decide. So he's, he's appealing to um, Felix's experience as, as a judge over these kinds of matters. So his, the beginning of his defense is that he's only been in Jerusalem for 12 days. 12 days is not enough time for anyone to start a revolution, you know, to, to amass an army and of any real threat to, to the Roman Empire or the Roman stability. It's not enough time. So this is where he starts, right? This is factual, right? He says, I've only been in Jerusalem for 12 days. So... This tells you, Felix, right, that I'm not a threat and that I would not have had enough time to start anything. So he's showing the, he's showing Felix that their claims have no base, you know, they're, they're baseless. So he continues, but this I confess to you, 
that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. So St. Paul here makes the claim, basically, that he's, you know, that he's just like them, right? He's, he's one of them. He's, that's what he's saying, right? Just like these men, I worship the God of my fathers, right? I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and I live my life according to that promise, you know, of the, of the resurrection of the dead, just like these men do, you know, to be on the just, to be with the just in the resurrection. And so he's, he's showing that his beliefs and that his lifestyle is not any different than his accusers, right? That he's not something apart from them. He show, it shows us here that St. Paul sees still Christianity, the faith in Christ as a continuation of the religion of the Jews and completely in harmony with it, right? He says, you know, all the, I believe everything in the law and the prophets, right? He says, I don't, I don't throw out the scriptures. I believe in the scriptures just like these men do. The difference, the big difference, as we know, between St. Paul and the, and the Sanhedrin is that he's accepted Jesus as the fulfillment of all that, of all the scriptures, right? That everything these men believe in, I also believe that the Messiah has come and that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. So would such a faithful person go to profane the temple, right? That's what he's saying. Like, just like these men are faithful, you know, and, and believing and believe in all the things written in the prophets and worship the God of our fathers. That's what I do. Would I go to the temple to profane it? Would they go to the temple to profane it? Why would I go to the temple to profane it, right? So he's, again, building the case that, right, like, this is baseless. So they have no argument against me because I'm, the, I'm just like them. I believe the same things that they do, just that he sees the fulfillment of all those things in Jesus Christ, right? That ultimately the law and the prophets were pointing to someone who is Jesus and that the ultimate meaning of the law and the prophets is in Christ, that the grace of God has been given to all men who seek God through his son, Jesus Christ. So St. Paul's next point there is that, you know, I'm just like these men. I believe the same things that they do. Uh, and I worship the same God that they do, right? So why would I go and profane the temple? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. So uh, St. Paul you know, tells the group basically that he had come down to Jerusalem to give the alms. Remember, uh, you know, we talked about how through his travels in Greece and you know, preaching and bringing people to Christ he was taking collections for the poorer Christians in Jerusalem because they were, had, they were suffering from very bad poverty. And so he said, I came to Jerusalem to deliver the alms, you know, to give the alms that I had collected. And uh, this was one of the main reasons for me coming to Jerusalem. And this is where they found me in the temple and started all this up. Uh, this shows us too, right, that St. Paul, so to this point, St. Paul has not brought this up at all, right, that he came to give alms. Uh, he in neither in neither of his defenses so far has he brought this up. So this shows us right that when we give alms, we as Christians, right, but as we, when we give alms, we should not draw attention to ourselves when we do it, right. We should not go and say, make sure everybody knows that we were the ones that gave, you know, the alms, and this is why we came, et cetera, et cetera, right. Saint Paul keeps this a secret until now. Um, I'm reminded of the words of of the Lord in Matthew chapter six, verses one through four, who says, "Take heed that you do not." do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Otherwise you have no reward from your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a, a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let, let your left hand 
know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed, charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So uh, this is St. Paul is living out these words, right? That he's, he secretly carried out this mission to bring alms to the poor. He also adds here an important detail, right? That at the time he was arrested, he was pure, being purified in the temple, meaning he was there offering sacrifices, right? If you remember from our last, uh, from our last meeting, right? St. James advised him to go and be purified with the men who were taking the Nazarite vow, go and pay for their sacrifices, so go pay for their vow. Again, showing that you're, you're willing to, you're still living the life according to the law as a Jew. And so, again, this is, he says, this is how they found me. They found me being purified in the temple, offering sacrifices, right? Again, does this sound like somebody who wants to defile the temple, right? Does it sound like somebody who wants to desecrate the temple? Of course not, right? Why would he be there offering sacrifices if he wanted to defile it? Again, it doesn't make any sense. He's trying to show Felix that their claims make no sense. Um, he also points to the fact that, right, his accusers, the ones that arrested him, the ones that grabbed him and beat him in Jerusalem that day, they're not even there, right? They're not, they didn't even come now when he's in Caesarea, they did not come to Caesarea to make, you know, to stand against him, to make the claims and, and to, to give the evidence for what happened. Uh, and remember, Felix being a judge, right? This is important, right? You can't condemn a Roman citizen without evidence. You have to have evidence. You have to have witnesses. You have to have something. You can't just say, well, he did this and then not substantiate it. So for Felix, this would have been an important detail, right? Like, hey, if these guys really felt so powerfully that I had done something wrong, they should be here today to accuse me themselves. Um, even those that were there in the court hearing St. Paul speak could not come up with anything, right? They, they can't come up with any evidence against him, which is, that's what he says, right? He says, or if some of you here have something to say, say it, you know, say it now, but they can't. The only thing that St. Paul can think of, right? The only thing he goes, says, basically, the only thing that I can think they might accuse me of is that I stood up and said that I'm, I'm being judged for the, my belief of the resurrection. Of the so again, St. Paul points to this being like a matter of Jewish theology, Jewish theological dispute. All right, so uh, St. Paul concludes his defense there. We're now in verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liber liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. So uh, Saint, uh, Felix uh, adjourns the case at that point based on the fact that, you know, St. Paul is making a better argument, basically, right, showing that these claims against him were silly. And um, it matches what St. Paul is saying also matches the letter that he had received from Lysias himself, right? Remember, Lysias had sent a letter with St. Paul saying such and, you know, this and that, and he's not deserving of death or chains, right? So, this, so basically everything that St. Paul said corroborated Lysias' account. So that so he has more to go off of on St. Paul's side than he does to go off of on the Pharisee side. Uh, so he tells the centurion to uh, keep St. Paul as a prisoner. So he doesn't release him because he doesn't want to incite the Jews, right? He doesn't want to make them angry and start something with them and have, have unrest in his city because uh, that would come down on his head. So he doesn't release him outright. But he keeps him under house arrest, basically for his protection, and he gives him more freedoms, right? He can be visited by his friends uh, who can come and bring things for him and provide for him. And, you know, he has, he has more freedoms now than he did before, showing again that Felix really doesn't think he's done anything wrong. Uh, but again, he doesn't want to start, start trouble. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he, had, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. So, uh, 
St. Paul's being imprisoned in Caesarea, being a prisoner in Caesarea, actually gives him the opportunity to proclaim the gospel now to the Roman governor, Felix, right? So St. Paul is, he's starting to work his way up the chain of command, right, of the Roman chain of command. He started with a military commander in Jerusalem. Now he's meeting with a governor. And he wants, again, to work his way all the way up to Caesar himself. So he's, you know, he's preaching the gospel and he's talking with him about, you know, morality, about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment that was to come. This, was, this would have been right up the alley for a Roman, because the Roman philosophy was all about, you know, living a good life, about these very topics, right? So St. Paul, again, being a wise preacher, he, he uses what he knows about his audience to tailor the message. Not that he's changing the message, but to, to use, you know, the right parts of the story, to basically connect with the person that he's speaking to. So he's, he doesn't speak, right? When he speaks with the Jews, he talks about the Old Testament. Here, he's not talking about the Old Testament with Felix, right? Felix has no, has no idea of the Old Testament. What he's doing, rather, is he's appealing to his, you know, his Roman, uh, you know, inclination to discuss, you know, things of morality and righteousness, to talk about Christ and, and the standards that God has set for his people through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, he would have also shared his own experiences, the things that he had witnessed, the things that he had seen God do, you know, in his own ministry. And as um, Felix hears this, he becomes afraid, right? Because he himself is not living up to the standards that St. Paul is presenting, right? You know, that, you know, Jesus came and he taught us how to live and he taught us to live righteously and to have self-control and to treat each other with love, et cetera, et cetera. And he's going to come again and he's going to, you know, basically judge the living and the dead based on how you live up to this righteousness. Well, Felix gets afraid by that because he's not living up to that righteousness. You know, he, um, the Jewish historian Josephus uh, writes about Felix that he was, pro he, he liked accepting bribes, which we just saw, right? He keeps calling Paul back into his, <laughs> he keeps calling Paul back to the court, hoping that he would bribe him, right? Hoping that Paul would show up one day with, a, you know, with some money so that he would release him. Well, St. Paul doesn't do that. And so he just again and again is meeting with him and talking with him. In addition, Felix had um, an illegal marriage. His wife, who, Drusilla, who's this um, a Jewish woman, she was, the, she was the wife of the king of Syria. And basically, she was unhappy in that marriage. And Felix basically stole her from him and married her. So Felix, you know, had, he, he was, like I said, he was not living up to this moral code that St. Paul was presenting. And so he doesn't particularly like hearing what St. Paul has to say and, and sends him away. It stands in opposition, right? If we think back all the way to the beginning of this book, on the day of Pentecost, St. Peter, you know, preaches on that day. And he basically tells the Jews, right, like, you killed the Messiah. That's, been, that's in the end of the day, that's the, that's the brunt of his, you know. You killed the Messiah. And they're cut to the heart and they say, what must we do, right? They repent. They hear, they hear of their unrighteousness and their wrongdoing. And they're saying, they say, what do, we, what do we have to do to get on the right side you know, of things, to, make, to, to, to do right by God? Here, Felix basically just wants to send Paul away so he doesn't have to think about it. Um, but because, again, God uses <laughs> even our human weaknesses to give him an opportunity to, to speak to us, right? Because of, because of Felix's greed, He's bringing Paul back again and again. Again, he's hoping to get a bribe, but it gives St. Paul more opportunities to preach and teach, you know, and talk with Felix. And the fact that he's willing to sit and converse with St. Paul each time shows that there's at least some genuine interest in hearing what he has to say. All right, now we'll finish off chapter 24 here. But after two years, Orsius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. So St. Paul, Paul is in Caesarea for two years as a prisoner, and just as a prisoner, you know, sitting there. Um, uh, in uh, Father Lawrence Farley's commentary on the Book of Acts, he writes that uh, Felix was removed from his position by the, Ro by the Romans for basically mismanagement and for uh, corruption. And the Jews were instrumental in this and making that happen. So his, his, uh, his theory is that he, he keeps Paul a prisoner there so that he can uh, kind of do something nice for the Jews um, because they're the ones that are accusing him of mismanagement and these other things. So he's like, well, maybe I can soften them up so that, you know, 
my accusers are not uh, won't be so harsh on me because again you know being recalled as a governor could could mean uh, you know you lose your head literally saint luke though is showing us right reading this reading this text he's showing us that as a prisoner for two years it has nothing to do with him being like a violent criminal right like he's he's not a dangerous person he's saint luke's been showing us right the injustice of it all of you know how he was arrested and how he was tried and all these things and also how corruption played into this and how he's now been a prisoner for two years for basically for no reason so uh saint luke is trying to show that saint paul and by extension the christians are not dangerous and really they're just get a bad rap and they're just you know been victims of uh, injustice and, and corruption in the uh the political system as well as as the religious uh, law system as well so that brings us now to the end of um chapter 24 and uh, we will we'll wrap up there are there any uh, any questions or or comments that i can address before we wrap up for the night going once going twice okay all right thank you all god bless god Thanks, willing we will, we will gather again next tuesday to we're almost to the end. We're getting there uh, to, to keep marching towards the end of the Acts of the Apostles. Mm -hmm. God Thank bless you all. Thank you for your time tonight and for your patience. And uh, may, may God enlighten us and be with us. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Good night.